All right. Well, thank you for your, this uh, invitation. I think I've worked with uh, some, if not most of you. Um, so I'm going to talk about non-malignant pleural fusion. This is the term that we prefer rather than saying benign pleural fusion because the word benign sometimes means that really it's of no clinical consequence, which we know that it's not true. Um, now, before I start this talk, even though the title is non-malignant pleural fusion, I will be going through a lot of um, slides which are basically um, designed to give you an understanding of how to work up just any pleural fusion. I'm going to try to emphasize the value of pleural fluid analysis because, as we will see, it's you know one of the most important tests you can do. So this part of the talk, meaning our first part, non-malignant fusion, is a little bit sort of dry and boring, uh, but it's a prelude to our second part, which is uh, paramalignant uh, or para-mnemonic uh, pleural fusion, which is actually a very important um, aspect of non-malignant fusion, a lot of science in it, a lot of controversy. So you just have to tolerate this part, um, and if you understand this one better, then I think the next one will be even better. It's kind of like Terminator, I guess. Uh, part two was better than the one, but you had to watch the part one to understand part two. Um, all right. Uh, so non-malignant fusion, this is sort of the um, outline of my talk. We'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of the tissue that we are dealing with. Um, normal pleural fluid characteristics, it's important to know. The problem is anytime we tap an effusion, obviously there's something going on uh, that led to that pleural effusion. So almost always we find some abnormal abnormality in the fluid. So we never really get to see a normal pleural fluid. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about pleural pressure. It's, again, a controversial topic. So, uh, a little e epidemiology of pleural fusions, pathophysiology. And then this is where we'll spend a lot of our time. And I will skip um, some of the slides because it's just, you know, you, you know most of this stuff. And then um, some words about this entity called unclear exudates or idiopathic pleural fusions. And then the treatment part. Um, all right, does anyone know who this guy is? Uh, of course, you can read English, so you know his name, but why is his picture here? All right, so this guy was, he was an Austrian. When he was very young, he used to work in his father's inn. And so they used to have guests who would come in, spend the night. And his father had assigned his duty to go in the cellar and um, check if they have enough wine to entertain the guests. So as a young boy, he realized that if he could tap on the casks, he could tell if there was enough wine there. And so he grew up to be a physician. And then because of his experience as a child, he, I guess, ended up doing uh, thoracic disease and pulmonology. So he would uh, fill up the chest of cadavers and use the same technique to figure out what's the fluid level. And so this is where we get the vocal fremitus and, you know, the, the, all the fancy stuff that you do. So this is the guy. Just remember his name next time you do a pleural effusion. So you've seen x-rays like this, uh, you know, classic pleural effusion with a little bit of mediastinal shift to the right. Sometimes you have confusion whether this is a pleural effusion or a mucus plug. But usually in mucus plug you will have your... Um, mediastinum shifted to the same side because there will be volume loss. So say, just just to give you an idea, I ask a lot of questions, not because I want to put anyone on the spot, but just to make it interactive. So say you had an x-ray like this, and there was no shift of the mediastinum. What would you think about? Cancer, but in what way? Yeah. Very good. So the, if there's an endobronchial uh, mass that's causing atelectasis, there are two forces. There's a loss of lung volume, but there's also buildup of fluid. So both forces, you know, balance each other. So there's not much shift in the mediastinum. The other possibility is if there's extensive uh, mediastinal spread of cancer, so the mediastinum just gets fixed. But uh, that's in, usually in malignant disease. One condition that you can see um, is histoplasmosis if it causes uh, fibrosing mediastinitis. So just remember, you know, if you're looking at an X-ray, just look at the mediastinum; it can give you an idea. So uh, the pleura, the tissue that we're dealing with, it develops from uh, the mesoderm. Uh, it, the two layers of the pleura, parietal and visceral pleura, they separate by the third week of gestation. Um, 
and the pleural cavity separates from the pericardial cavity pretty early on, ninth week of gestation. It's a pretty large tissue, as we know. Uh, its surface area is about 2,000 centimeters square in the adult male. Normally, there's a very small amount of fluid in the pleural space, about 8 to 10 cc, and the space itself is very, very small. Um, some people call it a potential space because there's really not much space. There's a little bit of moisture in between the two surfaces, and that's about it. And the two um, surfaces are joined at the pleural ligament. Um, it's, a, it's a vascular tissue, and the two layers get supplied from different um, circulatory systems. So you have the parietal pleura that's supplied by vessels from the intercostal artery, and they, they go, those arteries go all the way close to the mesothelial cells, whereas the visceral pleura uh, is supplied by the bronchial circulation, and they, those arteries they stay a little bit away from the cells, and you know, the uh, nutrition is uh, given to the cells through diffusion. Um, normally, as we'll see, the pleural fluid resorption is the function of the parietal pleura. So this is a, a microscopic picture of the pleura. This is the pleura right here. This is your lung. Um, so you've got the mesothel mesothelial cell here, and then this black line is the elastic lamina. Then you've got a little layer of connective tissue where you have lymphatics, blood vessels, a little bit of nerves, and then you have uh, another uh, layer of el elastic lamina, and then you've got the lung. So in cancer, if your if your uh, cancer so say you have a an adenocarcinoma sitting right here and it penetrates through this basal lamina, it can just enter the circulation and technically you have metastatic cancer. So this is this is you know just this little layer can dramatically change your um, stage of cancer. Uh, so how is the pleural fluid formed? So this is your lung right here. This is the extra pleural you know. Uh, Parietal interstitium. This is your pleural space. So you have um, pleural fluid that's you know seeped out through the capillaries, and then enters the pulmonary interstitium. Then it goes through the mesothelial cells of the visceral pleura and enters the pleural space, and then it is sucked in through these um, holes, which are stomas of the parietal pleura, about two to six microns. And as you breathe, they actually contract and uh, they absorb all the fluid, and then it enters the, um, the lymphatics. What is a normal pleural fluid? A very, very small in amount. Um, it's clear, 0 to, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milliliters per kg. Normally, adult males should have about 8 to 10 cc's of pleural fluid. It has very low protein, um, about 1 to 1.5 grams per deciliter, and most of it is albumin. It's not really that cellular, and whatever cells there are are mo mainly monocytes and macrophages. Important to know that normal pleural fluid should not have any eosinophils um, and very few neutrophils. So whatever cells there are are monocytes, some lymphocytes, some mesothelial cells. It's a pH is 7.6. Normally, its glucose level should be the same as the plasma. It has low LDH. Um, look at these two numbers. So the rate of production is 0.01 cc's per kg per hour. The rate of absorption is 0.28 cc's per kg per hour. So the body can absorb pleural fluid at a lot more, you know, a lot faster than it can produce. So if someone has a significant pleural effusion, there is something seriously wrong. Because you need, um, you need the production or the formation or the resorption to go down by about 30 you know, times before you start developing uh, pleural effusion. And as we said, uh, it's a parietal pleura that plays a very important role in absorption of pleural fluid. Um, this is probably not something you'll come across, but at the VA we do pleural manometry. We have this instrument. Uh, some of you may have used it or seen it. Uh, it's a digital pleural manometer, which is a little bit of fancy kind of the old school manometer. So what you can do is when you're doing a thoracentesis, uh, you can hook this up to the thoracentesis catheter, catheter and then the syringe goes on one side and you can, um, there's a little green button on the side, so as you turn it on, it gives you a read. That's your baseline pressure before you um, take out any fluid. And depending on how much fluid you're going to take out, you can check this pressure every 50 cc's, every 100 cc's, every 200 cc's, depending on how much fluid you're going to take out. And then you can plot this graph. And why, why is it important? So the pleural pressure, is, it's, it's normally minus 3 to minus 5 centimeters of water. It's very, very difficult to study pleural pressures because, as we know, the space is about 8 to 10 microns. There is a very small amount of fluid. So if I was to put a pressure transducer in that space, 
that pressure transducer by itself, by its presence, will affect the pressures. So it's very difficult to really get good, accurate measurements of pleural pressures in, in normal state. Um, and that's why there's a lot of confusion about it. How does it happen? There are many different theories about it, which I'm not going to go through. There's also controversy about whether pleural manometry really makes a difference in patient's uh, management, and there are two very strong schools of thought that don't agree with each other. Um, look at this number. If I was, if somebody had a pleural effusion, and I, I would say a, a two liters of pleural effusion, and I took out one liter, it's been shown that by just by taking out that one liter, their FE, FEV1 and FEC will increase by about 200 cc. That may sound like a lot, but it's really it's not. Um, which, which tells you what? By the way, why is this number important? We'll see in the next few slides, maybe. Or right, I'll, I'll just keep the secret for now. Um, so plural pressures, if they go below minus 20, if there's an increased risk of free expansion pomeoedema. That's why many times we tell you not to take more than 1.5 liters out, especially if the fusion was large to begin with and is chronic to begin with. It's those patients where you can have a pressure that goes below minus 20. There's still controversy about this um, number because this was actually seen in animals who had pneumothorax. There's no good human data. But in one retrospective study, they found that most patients who develop re-expansion pomeoedema, their pressures had actually gone below 25. So there's probably some truth to this number. If you're getting close to 20, if you're actually doing pleural manometry, just be careful. Um, one good benefit of pleural manometry is that if your pressure stays the same, then technically you can take out as much fluid as you want. So what, what do we do with these numbers? So you've got the, uh, the volume of fluid that you're removing, 100 cc, 200 cc, 500, depending on how much you're going to remove, you can plot it here. And then you can check the pleural pressures, and you can plot it like this. So normally, if the lung is completely normal and is able to expand as you're taking the fluid out, there should not be much change in the pleural space because whatever volume you're taking out is being occupied by the lung. So there's not much change. So say in a patient with hepatic hydrothorax because they have a low protein, they're not going to scar down their lung. Their pressures are more or less stay about the same. So if you're seeing that trend as you're taking fluid out, there's no reason for you to stop at 1.5 liters or 2 liters. You can technically take out as much as you want. So this, this way, pleural manometry can help um, decrease the number of procedures that a patient is going to do. Then there's a condition called uh, lung entrapment or entrapped lung where what happens is because of an acute inflammatory process, such as in paranemonic effusions, you have a light scar that forms on the surface of the lung. So as you're taking fluid out, the lung is expanding, but not as fast as it should. So your pressures will dip at the, you know towards the end. Patients can have a little bit of pain as well. That's called an entrapped lung or lung entrapment. And then you have a condition called the trapped lung. I didn't come up with these terms. They're very confusing, but there's a lung entrapment and there's a trapped lung. A lung entrapment is, I guess, the earlier stage of trapped lung. What happens in trapped lung is that your lung is now completely scarred down because patients had malignancy or an inflammatory process that's made a thick scar on the visceral pleura. So as you take the fluid out, the lung doesn't come up to occupy that space. So what's happening is that you're generating a a very strong negative pressure in the pleural space. So patients will start having severe pain. I mean, it's really bad. Um, sometimes it can be deep in the chest. Sometimes it can radiate to the shoulder, and it's sometimes unbearable. So if that happens, you know that at least physiologically they're acting like a uh, trap lung, and you can actually see this, that the moment you start taking fluid out, your pressures will go down very fast. And so in th that situation, you can either stop early or just slow down the drainage. You can you can drain the fluid in small sessions, not drain a liter at a time, maybe 200 cc's at one time. Patients will tolerate it better. It's seen a lot more in um, malignant effusions, but if patients have had um, cardiac surgery or they had a trauma and, you know, they had hemothorax that got ignored or they had paranormonic effusion, so they can develop trapped lungs. So just be aware that if you're taking fluid out, and especially towards the end, if you're taking out, say, 500 cc's in a patient who had a significant effusion for a long time, and the patient starts to have severe chest pain, it's probably a trapped lung. 
And if you get a chest X-ray after your procedure, it's almost always going to read as, or the radiologist will call you and say, there's a pneumothorax. Because for them, when they look at it, the lung hasn't expanded, there's, a, there's air in the pleural space. But this pneumothorax looks very different than an iatrogenic pneumothorax. This pneumothorax will have really no configuration. Sometimes the lung is attached in different areas. Why is it important? Because you shouldn't put a chest tube in this patient. Most of the time, uh, if you just give pain medicines, patients will get better. If it's a malignant effusion, you can put a pleural catheter or ask us to do a pleural catheter. So it's important to know what a trap lung is because if you start putting chest tubes in these patients, you can, you know, cause bigger problems. All right, let's go to epidemiology. As we know, pleural effusion is a pretty common problem. We see it all the time. 1.5 million cases of effusion are uh, seen in the U.S. annually. Causes are many, far too many to remember. But what's uh, good to know is that congestive heart failure, pneumonia, and malignancy account for about two-thirds of the cases. And there are a few slides um, towards the end where this information will be important. Uh, this is, again, that little diagram where I showed you how pleural fluid travels through all different you know, parts of the uh, pleural space to enter the lymphatics. It's important to uh, you know, remember this because a problem in any one of these areas can result in a pleural fusion. So if you have a high ultrafiltrate pressure, um, increased interstitial pressure, all of these can lead to buildup of pleural space or pleural effusion in you know, many different ways. So you've got increased hydrostatic pressure because somebody's in CHF, or you have decreased oncotic pressure um, because so the fluid doesn't stay in the interstitium, just keeps leaking out into the pleural space like in patients with cirrhosis. Uh, decreased pleural pressure, so you have a negative pressure like we talked about, and just keeps sucking on the pleura, so it basically keeps drawing fluid out. That's what's seen in trap lung. Um, inflammation or infections increase the permeability of endothelium, so fluid leaks out, such as in pneumonia. Uh, lymphatics can get blocked by many different reasons, most commonly malignancy, and so they don't really drain the pleural space. The fluid keeps building up as in malignancy. Uh, fluid can leak up from the abdomen, as in hepatic hydrothorax. Um, and then if one of you just does not use ultrasound and puts the CVL in the pleural space, that's another reason. Or I've seen a, a tube feed, actually, a, a daub-off tube, perforate the esophagus, end up in the uh, pleural space for days, for days. And the patient was on cardiology with a huge pleural effusion, and they thought it was just all CHF and maybe asthma. So when we tapped it, it was trauma care or whatever. So, you know, I have to remember if there's a rapidly building pleural effusion after you did something to the patient, and keep that in mind. Um, history, I'm not going to go through all this. Obviously, effusions can be asymptomatic, but dyspnea and chest pain is the most common. How do pleural effusions cause dyspnea? What's the mechanism? I, I've mentioned all of these. This is where the idea of trap lung is important. So the traditional thinking has been, well, either it's fluid, it doesn't allow the lung to expand, that's how patients get dyspneic. It's not really true. That's not really the main mechanism. Why is it so? Because even patients with trap lung, lungs that are not going to expand, they're fixed in place. When you take their fluid out, they feel better many times. So it's obviously not the re-expansion of the lung that's the main mechanism. So we don't know. The, the, the real answer is we don't know all the mechanisms how pleural fusions cause dyspnea. But we know that decreased uh, expansion of the lung is not the main problem. So I think the, the many people think that the main reason is that when you have pleural uh, effusion, it doesn't allow that side of the diaphragm to move well. And your diaphragm has a lot of nerves. There's a lot of neurogenic mechanisms. So just imagine if somebody has a liter of effusion, say 500 cc's of effusion on the left side, what is the extra weight being put on that hemidiaphragm? Hmm? 500 what? Grams? Yeah. Or if you have a liter of fluid on the left side, what is the extra weight that that ME diaphragm is having to work against? A kilogram, right? So just imagine your ME diaphragm is having to, with every breath, it's almost like taking, doing bench presses, right? 
So that's that's significant. You take out that fluid and you you know uh, improve the movement of the diaphragm. And then there are neurogenic mechanisms. If you have a patient who's very dyspneic and has maybe a little bit of pleural effusion, but the pleural effusion does not really explain, or the amount is not enough, the you know maybe the chronology of the effusion doesn't fit. Think of a PE because PEs can cause dyspnea not by causing pleural effusion but by other mechanisms. Important to know. Uh, chest pain obviously it can happen, especially if the you know, pleura is very inflamed. Um, one important point is that if someone on the floor or in clinic is complaining of pain that uh, is in the posterior part of the neck, shoulders over here, and you've done all you can, MRIs and CTs, and you just can't find a reason, is think about pleuritis or pleurisy affecting the diaph- uh, diaphragmatic pleura because that could be uh, pain that's radiating up. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all this, but this is just to give you an idea that, that not all effusions are symptomatic, uh, and that's, there's some that are almost always symptomatic. So lupus pleuritis, pneumonia, uh, post-cardiac injury syndrome, PE, CHF, almost always these patients will be uh, symptomatic. But then there are others that may be walking around with significant effusions. Um, I think most of you know all this history of asbestos exposure. This is probably a bold question. Uh, if you have a bloody effusion in someone who used to work in a boiler room or do other things that you know expose them to asbestos, and maybe in about 10 to 20 years after he finished that job, he has a bloody effusion that otherwise looks okay, patients are asymptomatic, think of a benign asbestos-related pleural effusion. The rest of, the rest of these are you know, fairly easy to remember. Um, this is another one that they can ask you in boards, uh, a dural pleural fistula. Um, if I remember, I was asked a question that there was a patient who was shot from the side and the bullet went through his spine and they, you know, did all kinds of surgery and the patient went home and then later on he came in uh, with a pleural fusion. And so when they tapped it, it was like water. So that's a dural pleural fistula. You can see it after trauma. You can see it with cancers, sometimes infections, sometimes surgery. Um, obviously, the bigger the effusion is, the more symptomatic the patient is going to be. Small effusions may not be you know, seen on physical examination, and as they get bigger, up to a liter or so, then you'll start seeing all the signs and symptoms uh, on physical examination. Same is the case with chest X-ray. Uh, the first place where the pleural effusion will accumulate will be the posterior costophrenic angle on a lateral chest X-ray, even up to five cc's can be identified. And as they get bigger, uh, you have more and more opacification. So about half a liter or so, you'll have opacification of the lung base. Uh, this is an important slide as well. So there are some effusions that can cause massive, some causes that can cause massive pleural effusion, meaning your entire hemithorax may be filled with effusion. Not every condition does that. Uh, TBs, one, empyema, hepatic hydrothorax, chylothorax, hemothorax, and CHF. If you can remember maybe all of these, they are easy to remember. You'll probably cover 90% plus of massive pleural effusions. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about ultrasound and thoracentesis in my next talk. There's some very interesting, controversial, somewhat scary data on ultrasound and thoracentesis. But you, for most of you, this picture is very, you know, familiar. The three ultrasonic features of a pleural fusion is that there should be a anechoic or hypoechoic space. Anechoic if there has very little cellular debris, and then as you get more and more cellular debris, either malignant cells or um, infection, uh, then you get more and more um, echogenicity of the effusion. Uh, the boundaries of the effusion should be chest wall up here, diaphragm, and the lung. And then the third is it should be a hyperdynamic, you know, view. You, you should have some movement. So those three are the um, ultrasonic features of a pleural effusion. Sometimes if patients have an ascites, the, the capsule of the liver will be very shiny, and so you can get a little confused with it. So make sure that you're able to identify the diaphragm. That's the most important part when you're doing thoracentesis. CT is important because it can tell us not just about diffusion, whether it's loculated, whether there's underlying lymphadenopathy, a lung mass, what does the lung look like. So CTs can help when um, diffusions continue to recur. You can't drain them or patients have other signs. 
what do you do with plural fusions? Um, I'm sure you understand, you know, the, uh, the part about, uh, Thor's and T's. Then we'll go through some of the data on that. Uh, small effusions don't have to be tapped. Uh, if the, the picture is pretty classic, for example, CHF, um, patients don't have to be tapped. However, uh, we get called a lot about, um, patients who are in CHF, short of breath, whatnot, and they have a significant effusion. And when we ask uh, the, the physician, you know, what are they doing about the effusion, they say, well, we're diuresing the patient. Generally, if you have a significant, <clears throat> whatever the definition of significant is, but say a half a liter of transudative effusion in the setting of CHF, it's not going to go away with just diuresis. So you almost always have to tap it at least once to get it dry, and then you can optimize their therapy. So you have to you know, just keep that in mind. Um, and then if it's a new effusion, happens for the first time, it's significant, then I think almost always you have to um, tap it. So um, how, why do we pay so much emphasis on thoracentesis and plural fluid analysis? Because, you know, studies have shown, this is an old study in 87, it showed that if you just have plural fluid analysis, you can come to a definitive diagnosis in about 18%, about one-fourth of the patients, presumptive probable diagnosis in about 55% of the patients. So about two-thirds of the patients can have either a definitive or a probable diagnosis just based on plural fluid analysis. That's why it's important. A third will probably still stay um, undiagnosed and will you know, go over some of the information about it. But still, if it's completely negative, uh, it can still be helpful in excluding infection. So it's completely negative or unrevealing plural fluid analysis is not, you know, not worthless. Um, I put this number 30 cc's here, but really it depends on how much testing you're going to do and really where you're sending this test. If you're at the VA, I don't know, send more. So, uh, but don't send the whole bag. Oh, this is something I want to remind you. Over here, you can send the whole bag. At the VA, if you send the whole bag, they'll probably throw it in the trash. I, I've gone to the lab like days later looking for results, and the bag was sitting there because they say, what do you want us to do with it? Um, always take one of those cytolite vials. from the. You can take it from the Bronx um, and then put about 25 cc's, 30 cc's. So send, send at least 50 cc's at the VA and um, put it in the cytolite. Then they'll process it. So, you know, different labs have different ways of doing it, uh, but over here, I think you can probably send the whole bag and they can, you know, um, take care of it, but not at the VA. Cytology is important. There's some situations where you can just, um, you know, all you need is a plural fluid analysis. You don't need anything else. Uh, I'm sure you know about empyema. So if, if I, if I um, do thoracentesis on a patient and I get gross pus, what other test do you want me to do on it in order to diagnose this patient with empyema? PH. PH. What else? There's got to be some test. ESR? Procalcitonin, right? That's the one that's going to clinch the diagnosis. All right, so this is a trick question. You don't need any other test. This is the, this is the, this is the point. If you get pus through pleural space, your diagnosis is done. I don't care what the albumin is. I don't care what the pH is. I don't care. The pH will help you manage the patient because if it's very low, you may need drainage. But the diagnosis of empyema is done once you get aspira aspiration of pus. That's it. Now the other tests, you know, the cultures are obviously those are tests to manage your empyema, but the diagnosis of empyema is just presence of gross pus in the pleural space. Um, TB pleuritis, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's kind of rare here, and pleural, pleural fluid analysis can or cannot help. Uh, lupus pleuritis, you can find an ANA level, fungal disease, um, chylomicrons or chylothorax, hemothorax. If your pleural fluid to blood ratio is more than 0.5 and then uh, biliopleural fistula, you can probably see it after um, ERCPs, if, you know, this was a complicated ERCP. Um, oh. There, these are some other um, conditions where the, just the plural fluid analysis can help you. This is something they're probably going to ask you in uh, medicine boards. Urinothorax, typical case will be 
surgery for kidneys or someone who has renal stones and they show a CT or do an ultrasound and the kidneys are ballooned up and now the patient has a new pleural effusion. Think of urinothorax, very classic medicine board question. And the dural pleural fistula that I talked about, the test that they'll probably ask in boards is a beta-2 transferrin. That's the protein that's present in the CSF. So if you get uh, what looks like water and you check a beta-2 transferrin, that's a dural pleural fistula. Um, this is just, you know, the appearance of pleural fluid can give you a diagnosis. I talked about uh, uh, pus, which is empyema, urine, which is urinothorax, water-like, which is dural pleural fistula, um, yellow-green rheumatoid pleurisy, very rarely seen, but still possible. Um, and then if you have a bloody effusion, it's not always cancer, it's not always TB, it's not always infection, but could be benign asbestos-related pleural effusion. These are all questions that they will you know, somehow ask you in, uh, in boards. You already know the LIGHTS criteria. Why do we care about the LIGHTS criteria? Why can't we come up with something else? Well, because there are so many studies that, that, that have looked at LIGHTS criteria, from Dr. LIGHTS original study in 72 to all these studies, and they consistently show that LIGHTS criteria is the best in terms of sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, positive predictive, negative predictive value. So that's why we have to stick with LIGHTS criteria. No one has been able to uh, dislodge it from its pedestal, I guess. Uh, there are other some studies that will be helpful in pseudo exudate uh, kind of situations. Uh, plural fluid cholesterol, depending on what study you look at, they've come up with cutoffs of 45, 55, 60, but at least above 45. So higher it is, more likely it is to be a true exudate. Um, we'll talk about the rest. So LIGHTS criteria is not perfect. Uh, it can misclassify transudates, about 10 to 20 percent transudates as exudates, which we call pseudo-exudate. Typical example will be CHF or hepatic hydrothorax, which is getting diaries. So this study looked at, you know, what can we do in those situations? So we can do either a serum to plural fluid albumin gradient of greater than 1.2 or a ratio uh, less than 0 0.6. And they found that the gradient works better for CHF. 83% of CHF and the uh, ratio works better for hepatic hydrothorax. So send an albumin on your fluid if you're really thinking of hepatic hydrothorax or uh, CHF. The other thing you can do is check a BNP, which I don't know if they check it here. But there are many studies going back all the way to 2008 which have looked at the value of BNP in plural fluid in patients with CHF. And as you can see, it's got a pretty good sensitivity in the 90s to 100s, good specificity. But this is what is important. Uh, these are effusions, or the percentage of effusions, which were misclassified by LIGHTS criteria and then got correctly classified using a BNP. So as you can see, 75% to 100%. Mm -hmm. It's also a year, but you have to call the pathology medicine. All right, well, all the best. Uh, but something to think about, you know, because, again, if you have a guy with rapidly accumulating effusion, now you're asking to put a chest tube. You want to know what it is. If you've got a good BNP in there, well, it's probably just CHF. Maybe, you know, you don't need to put a um, chest tube. But I'm just going to skip all through this. Uh, you already know this. What is the relation between pH and glucose? They're directly related. And there are two ways that your pH can be low in pleural fluid. One is that there's a lot of metabolism going on because of infection because the bacteria are consuming all the glucose or you have cancer. And so there's a lot of uh, CO2 and lactic acid being generated. That's one. But the other is that uh, maybe the metabolism is not the problem, but the membranes through which carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out are now thickened and their permeabilities decrease, such as in rheumatoid and um, maybe even cancer. Um, this is probably a classic medicine board question. Classic medicine board question. That's why I put it in italics here. Very low glucose in the setting of joint disease, maybe yellow-green effusion. That's a rheumatoid uh, effusion. It has a very, very low glucose. Um, total cell count, we almost always send it. It really doesn't help. What helps is the differential cell count. Uh, if you have neutrophils more than 50%, think of paranemonic effusions or a PE if there's no infiltrate and other infectious processes. Lymphocytic, you know, lymphocytes are one of those things that are going to come in any time the effusion sitting there for a long time. So a lymphocyte-predominant effusion, even though we think about 
TB and cancers, it's not always the case. If you let any fusion sit around for a long time, the lymphocytes are going to start accumulating. But then there are other causes that, you know, you can look at. Uh, TB is one of those things that's always asked about. Malignancy may be another, and then a smattering of other causes. Uh, eosinophils, How, what's the percentage of eosinophils is in normal pleural fluid? I, I told this about 30 minutes ago. Zero. Okay, so you were awake at least back then. Um, so, you know, as pulmonologists, we have this romance with eosinophils. Anytime you have eosinophils and lung disease, oh my God, people get excited. Cases are being presented all over the country. Really, I mean, it's very nonspecific. If you look at eosinophil and lung disease, you can think of any disease, and it's on that list. But again, it makes a good presentation. So, um, eosinophils in your plural fluid means either air or blood most of the time, you know, from a practical standpoint. What is important is, for whatever reason, don't ask me the reason, if you have eosinophils in your plural fluid, it can be whatever, but it's probably not going to be TB. This is, this is probably an observation that you know, people have made, but, uh, you know, have, having eosinophils more than 10% almost always rules out TB. Amylase, you know, for pancreatic pseudocysts and esophageal rupture, you can uh, look at isoenzyme. Uh, never forget ruptured ectopic pregnancy. We talked about the cholesterol, above 45, about 50, above 60 different cutoffs, but at least above 45 for true exudates. Um, this is another one of the favorite board questions, difference between chylothorax and pseudochylothorax. Um, chylothorax is the presence of fat, triglycerides. Pseudochylothorax is the presence of cholesterol. And chylothorax is usually an acute condition. Uh, pseudochylothorax is a chronic condition called the chronic inflammatory processes like TB, rheumatoid, empyema, and this is usually more traumatic, acute process. This is mainly lymphocytic. This is mainly neutrophilic. And what is important is that this is mainly uh, the presence of triglycerides. So your triglycerides should be more than 110, and your cholesterol should be less than 200, and you should have chylomicrons in plural fluid. In pseudochylothorax, um, your triglycerides can be, uh, can be more than 110, but what is important is that your cholesterol should be more than 200. So that's the difference between this, this, this piece has to be there. That in one, your cholesterol is less than 200. In the other, your cholesterol is more than 200 because sometimes the triglycerides can be there, more than 110. So always remember to look at the cholesterol. And I remember, I think, in my medicine board, they actually put this question there. Um, ADA, I don't know if they check it here. It has pretty good sensitivity. In, in places in the world where TB is endemic, they, they sometimes don't even check a PPD because everybody's PPD positive. So if somebody develops a pleural fusion, it's lymphocyte predominant, they send an ADA, that's good enough for them. They don't need pleural biopsies or whatnot. Um, pleural fluid viscosity is very rarely checked, but again, in TB pleuritis, it has a pretty good sensitivity up to 90%. Um, I'm going to go over CRP. Okay, this is the part that I wanted to talk about. Somebody has TB or TB pleuritis, we always do a thorus and TC. We sometimes consider a pleural biopsy, but... Thoracentesis by itself has very poor sensitivity in TB pleuritis. The numbers are all over the place, but I think in reality they're a lot closer to the lower number. Uh, pleural biopsies are helpful in endemic areas, close pleural biopsies, but over here we do pleuroscopy where we put a f almost a fiber optic scope in the pleura done under conscious sedation. So if you're suspecting someone to have TB pleuritis, all you need or think the patient needs Plural biopsy, just call us. We can consider a, a uh, pleuroscopy, which is much, uh, I guess, less risky than, than WATS. Um, treatment, I'm not going to go through all this. It's, it's obvious that you have to treat the underlying cause, whatever that underlying cause is. Um, but this is the part that I wanted to talk about. So indwelling plural catheters are now available, and I, I should say, appropriately indicated for non-malignant pleural fusions. Traditionally, these uh, catheters were introduced for palliation of patients with malignant effusions, and that's still the biggest uh, indication. But as you can see, there are many studies with, you know, relatively smaller studies 
that have used these indwelling pleural catheters like Plurex or Espera, which we do at the VA. We do Plurex here, Espera at the VA. They're both somewhat similar. Now, we always worry about, well, the catheter is going to stay in for a long time because most of the patients with malignant effusion don't survive long enough. But say you've got a guy with CHF or hepatic hydrothorax or renal disease, it, they may survive years. So we always worry about infections. We about worry about draining their albumin and electrolytes. That's still a legitimate worry, but the studies will show that your your complication rate is still, you know, uh, not not that high. I mean, these numbers look enormous, but these are smaller studies. Um, if we go by particular etiologies, hepatic hydrothorax is one of those things where it's like, no way, no, no way can you put a chest tube. I mean, that's still what people think most of the time. This small study of about 19 patients showed that the infection rate after putting these pleural catheters was about 5%, which is actually the infection rate in patients with malignant effusion. So the infection rate with indwelling pleural catheters is about 5 to 6%. Um, the only difference was that these patients, the hepatic hydrothorax patients, they did not develop spontaneous pleurodesis. So when you put the pleuris catheter in, it's, you know, it's a foreign body, basically. What it does, it generates a fibrogenic reaction, and in about half of the patients you can have pleurodesis just by the presence of that catheter. In patients who are going to survive a little longer, like breast cancer patients with effusion, the rate is a little higher than patients who are going to die early, for example, lung cancer. But about half of the patients at some point may have pleurodesis. But patients with parochirothorax, you know, there is very poor pleurodesis rate because this uh, median time to spontaneous pleurodesis was about 200 days as opposed to inflammatory pruritus, which was within a month. Um, Overall, it's about, you know, three months or so. Uh, the infection rate, as you can see, is about 3%. So if you have a patient with CHF, um, dialysis, uh, maybe recurrent paranomonic effusion who's just not getting better, you're having to do thoracentesis, in a, uh, you know, every so often, don't think that that's not an indication for indwelling pleural catheters. There's another study, small study of 14 patients where they use indwelling pleural catheters um, and patients did okay. Now, having said that, these studies were done in patients who were waiting for a more definitive therapy. Right? These were not patients who were going to just live with a pleural catheter. They were waiting for either TIPS or heart transplant or kidney transplant or lung transplant or heart transplant, whatever have you. So this was used as a bridge to get them better. But sometimes you have these patients who are just not a candidate for anything. And uh, even for palliation, this is something that uh, can be considered. So do call us if you have a question, uh, and we can certainly, you know, consider it. Uh, even in end-stage renal disease, this is a relatively new study of about only nine patients where patients had uh, a pleural catheter put in for recurrent dialysis-associated effusion. So all of them had improvement in their dyspnea after about two weeks. There were no infections, no decrease in albumin. There was no change in survival, which is understandable. These are not designed to improve survival. It's a, it's a method of palliation. And um, in about four patients, about half of them, these catheters were eventually re uh, removed because the effusions went away and they, they had uh, pleurodesis. So you can also have pleurodesis in these patients. About you know, it's a small study, so you can't really look at the percentages. Okay, a few words about unclear exudates. Uh, what is an unclear exudate? This is an effusion that is an exudate by lights criteria, and uh, you've done everything that you can think of, physical examination, looking at their drug history, whatever have you. Uh, you've done pleural fluid analysis, and still the cause remains unclear. That's called an unclear exudate, and if you add a pleural biopsy to it, and you're still uh, not um, coming up with a diagnosis, that's called an idiopathic pleural effusion. Again, I didn't make these terms. Um, so about 25% of the pleural effusions will be an unclear exudate, but 20% of the pleural effusions will be idiopathic pleural effusion, which means that in these situations, even if you added a pleural biopsy, take all comers with unclear exudates and you do pleural biopsy, you know, still about 15 to 20%, maybe, you know, even the pleural biopsy will not help, uh, except in situations like malignancy or uh, TB pleuritis. And this is also called non-specific pleurite. So what do we worry about in these patients? You have a guy with an exudate, maybe lymphocyte predominant. You've done two thoracentesis, maybe even a pleural biopsy, and it's negative and it keeps coming back. What would you worry about? 
down the road. Yellow nail syndrome or something more common. What could what could worry you in the state of Kentucky in someone who's 50 something year old has a recurrent lymphocyte predominant exudative effusion with negative workup for infections or whatnot? Or any cancer. Cancer is one. What is the other one? Histo possibly. Histo generally doesn't give you big effusions. What is another infection that can give you a lymphocyte predominant exudative effusion? TB. TB pleuritis. As we said, you know, pleural fluid analysis sometimes is not really helpful. Sensitivities are poor. So that's what we worry about, right? That's why we want to keep a close eye on these patients. Well, there are some studies that actually looked at these patients. They followed them sometimes up to years. And they looked at them very closely. Every time the fusion recurred, they did a tap again and um, ran the whole, you know, gamut of tests again. And what they found out that actually that fear is not real. Uh, if you take this study out where only, you know, about 35% of the patients were found to have a cause and maybe about 25% had malignancy, 5% here, 8% here, 12% here. These were the patients who had multiple taps in the beginning and a pleural biopsy. Nobody could figure out why they have an exudative effusion. They continue to follow these patients for years and years and years and see how few patients actually developed malignancy or were eventually found to have malignancy. Uh, very few of them had uh, mesothelioma. And again, very few of them actually had TB. And how many of them do you think got better on their own? Most or few? Most. Actually, in these studies, most patients, in one study, up to 80% of these patients, the effusions just went away. Nobody knew what happened or what started all this, but they just got better. So we don't know what this thing is. Some people call it non-specific pleuritis, which is, you know, we the physicians are very smart. We, we try to hide our ignorance behind these fancy terms. Idiopathic, cryptogenic, non-specific, primary. These are all ways to say, you know, we don't know what's happening. So this is one of those things. Um, so if you see a patient who has a recurrent exudative lymphocytic predominant uh, effusion, yeah, you worry about cancer, you worry about TB, but, uh, you know, it's not like if you missed cancer, it's going to be something big. Most of the time, those patients will not have cancer. Most of the time, those patients will not have TB, and most of the time, they will actually get better on their own. Um, so summary, uh, just remember these three causes, CHF, hepatic hydrothorax, paranormonic effusions, Remember that your pleural fluid analysis and LIFES criteria is still the most important test you can do. Um, treat the underlying cause, and remember this part, that uh, pleural catheters are now appropriate for patients with dialysis-related effusions, CHF-related effusions, paranormonic effusions, even hepatic hydrothorax. Many GI doctors will not like it, but I think it's appropriate because if you're going in every week to do a thoracentesis, might as well have a pleural catheter. It's like doing thoracentesis and the rate of infection and all those things we worry about, at least by studies. Small studies, retrospective studies, not the best, but at least the evidence, the data is those patients do okay, especially if they're going as a for a transplant. So this is us. You know us. We are here for all your pleural needs. So call us for thoracentesis, Plural manometry, if, if you're at the VA, call us for pleuroscopy here, call us for plural catheters, or if you just want to chat with us. So this was Terminator 1. Boring, not that hi-fi, but the next one, Terminator 2, is where I'll be back. Okay? That one's really nice. I, I actually enjoy that talk. Plural disease is one of my favorite subjects because there's so much unknown and uh, it's just an interesting tissue to deal with. All right, I hope you've learned something today, and uh, it's time for you to wake up. All right, thank you, guys. <laughs>